great. So um, thanks for pulling up the slides. Uh, for what, I, what Will and I decided might be useful is to show a version of a, a, some slides that I showed at the Arctic Summit Science um, Week meeting in Prague last week. And this is really uh, what we're really trying to do through USA on right now and through the IARPIC observing team is, is generate engagement, understand what's leading to engagement, and, and to focus on some of the leadership issues um, that uh, might be missing in our community or might be um, underutilized. Um, so this concept of fostering first followers is sort of an organizational um, way of thinking for the USA on right now. So I don't have time to show this video, uh, but I, it's, my, it's my teaser to strongly encourage you to watch the video and think about um, what it means for your work and what you need in terms of interagency or, or even interinstitutional uh, leadership to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish with Arctic observing. It's, uh, it's an annotated video called The Leadership Lessons from the Dancing Guy. And I'll summarize the leadership lessons um, on this screen. And then as we walk through the rest of the presentation, hopefully some of these lessons uh, make more sense how they might apply to what we're trying to do here. So the, the first lesson from the video is that a leader, um, whether it be your network or your, pro your, your large research project, um, is a lone nut without followers. And so in order to lead, you really need, and to develop your network, you need to be easy to follow. You need to be uh, operating uh, with clarity and transparency and to have a lot of people in the community understand what it is that you're trying to do. Uh, another really critical concept from the video is that the first person who gets what you're doing, the first person who follows along, the first person who collaborates with you and enhances your work is really key because they, they really play this vital role in helping um, other people uh, kind of understand how to follow you. And, and that really underscores what we try to do through IARPIC is we try to do um, a lot of these things in public so that there's a lot of transparency, there's a lot of visibility and opportunities to ask questions um, so that more people can join in on key activities. So this is a, a snapshot from uh, the Arctic Observing Viewer, uh, which we've talked about a little bit in this venue before. And what this is really trying to show, um, maybe not with great success in one snapshot, is there are a tremendous number of uh, observing sites, um, sustained observing activities in the Arctic that are funded by uh, US agencies or that are um, happening in partnership with US agencies. This picture, this snapshot shows 13,000 data collection sites, yet we still in the United States don't have a really coherent concept of what our US Arctic observing network is. So to me, that's, you know, whether it's actually 10,000 sites or 6,000 sites or some are networked and some aren't, is less important than the idea that we have a tremendous amount of stuff going on, but we still don't have a really coherent sense of what our observing network is. And it's important to understand our network with coherence because through networks we generate, uh, we, we generate the network effect. We're able to scale, leverage, share, um, harmonize, do a lot of really valuable activities that make these observations more valuable to the people who use them. And so some of those, some of those networking kinds of activities, uh, we need to, under, to, to support those networking activities, we need to understand what observations are widely valuable, who's using them, um, how they get the information, what their use preferences are. And we really need experts, um, observational experts, in partnership with modelers and other practitioners to foster harmonization and integration. This is really, really critical in network development. And so typically when we talk about the kinds of things that are standing in the way of a, of a kind of coherent or comprehensive Arctic observing network, 
we tend to focus on the first two items, that it's very expensive to er uh, observe in the Arctic, and that there's, you know, we're also operating behind the so-called white curtain. There's a lot of technological constraints that get in the way, polar night, freezing cold temperatures, um, you know, impenetrable landscapes, and that type of thing. But what we don't spend a lot of time talking about is, is the vision and leadership challenges. And so that's why the focus of the Prague talk um, in the international setting and this talk in our interagency setting is really on vision and leadership. And I, I don't mean to discount the importance of the first two. It's, um, it's just that we're probably going to make most progress on the vision and leadership point within um, IARPIC. So we, last time we described the, the new US Aon capabilities that have come online, and I've just succinctly summarized them here again for reference or for those of you who weren't on the call last time. They include our US Aon Funders Board. So this is really the, uh, the IARPIC staff group uh, and, and federal funders who are focused on observation. Um, and they are convening uh, on a more regular basis. They haven't convened as such uh, before. And their role is really to provide an overarching vision. Um, I'll give you some ideas of what that vision might look like, but also to help guide the, qu the community towards some quick win opportunities and, and potentially play some role in resourcing those quick wins. There's also my position created by NOAA as the um, executive director for the US Aon. Uh, NOAA and EPA have put agency researchers forward. Um, NASA, NSF, DOI, DOE, other, other agencies are looking at the kinds of either in-kind or funding resources they might contribute as well. And then, of course, there's what we're doing here on this team, which is the community engagement. But really, uh, I think what we can can focus on here is our first performance element, uh, or I'm sorry, our second performance element, which is really what we need to do to foster the research networks, um, the smaller uh, research networks that are going to be supporting this larger effort. So the developing vision, I won't dig deep into this, but just uh, really highlight the underlined words that, that for our network to be successful, it needs to be integrated. It needs to be well-defined, and we need to enable access. Um, these are going to be some of the qualities that we really need to strive for. So in, in, in referring back to what the US Aon uh, Funders Board has been talking about at great length is the different ways that we might approach the challenge before us right now. And we're thinking about this at, at two levels, um, two time frames, two scopes, if you will. And the first is the tactical approach, which really says start where you are, start with what's funded, start with what's out there, and optimize and utilize it, um, draw people together around it, and, and generate, generate momentum that way. And so two examples uh, of starting where you are could be um, found in many of the IARPIC performance elements. Uh, these could be developed into USA on tasks in a variety of ways, and we're, we're still very much seeking input on how this could happen. Um, another related effort is the US Global Change Research Program's um, Arctic Indicators uh, Project, which is a, an, an emerging effort under USGCRP, and, and they have some ideas that might be valuable to look towards. But what we want to hear from you today about is other ideas um, and other efforts as well. So what do these look like? Um, here's a snapshot uh, of a figure you've probably seen that's a summary of the IARPIC research plan, the, the nine goals with environmental intelligence being the goal in the center. And then distributed across this diagram are the different performance elements in the task that are, are very observationally oriented. Um, and so one, one tactical approach is to identify and foster and hopefully resource some of the shovel-ready opportunities that are presented within those performance elements. The IARPIC plan is certainly going to be a key guide for us towards what we do, um, but there's, there's also more in here than we could possibly begin to address uh, year one. So we need some focus. Similarly, with the, the, uh, the Arctic indicators, um, similar diagram, similar concept, 
these are more indicator oriented than explicitly uh, observational data products, but it's, it's very related. Um, do some of these uh, relate to IARPIC uh, objectives in such a way that we might be able to um, really bolster our case for why we focus on what we focus on? So these are tactical approaches. They both suffer from uh, the problem of being somewhat ad hoc. Uh, we can't be comprehensive. We have to down select. Um, and we have to use good rationale for why we down select, but we have to start somewhere, and so that'll be part of the process, certainly. The other approach that the board's been talking about a lot is the more strategic approach, where you really take, take a longer period of time, draw in more partners and more uh, resources, but really think about where you want to go. And so an example of a community that employed this strategy to great effect is the Global Ocean Observing System, or GOOSE. And I'll just kind of walk you through what their framework looks like, because it's suggestive of how we might proceed um, if, we, if we deem that a valuable direction. So this is a pretty hard to read spaghetti diagram, but it shows the, um, the sort of strategic mapping that the GOOSE community used to identify its essential ocean variables. So remember, this is the ocean observing system. And in the center of the screen, you see um, the, the ocean variables. Can you see my pointer? No. OK. I mean, so I Sandy, to... you can, yeah, you can use this pointer up at the top here. OK. Of the screen. Can oh, I see that, that pointer. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> the essential ocean variables, there it is, um, are in the middle. And on the left-hand side of that is the process they used to develop the requirements, which was based on a societal benefits um, framework that you see outlined here. So they recognized that ocean observing contributes to climate adaptation, marine services, human health, food security. So we've heard these themes come up. Um, Erica, Erica Key mentioned this quite a bit when she was developing um, the Arctic Observing Assessment. And more recently, SAON employed this approach in its Arctic Observing Framework. So um, societal benefits are a valuable tool to use in these broader frameworks. But they also evaluated the observing platforms that they had, the observing networks that they had, and the data networks that they had. And, and at the convergence of the impact side, the requirement side, and the readiness side for the technologies, they were able to identify a pretty, a pretty manageable list of essential variables to use to guide their community forward. And so I'll just zip ahead. Well, I'll briefly say that different sections of this, importantly, were led by different authoritative research bodies and networks, kind of getting us back to this question that we're going to pose to you at the end. Who are some of these key bodies and, um, and networks uh, within the Arctic that could maybe divide and conquer on a, a large framework like this? So in the end, Goose was pretty successful in its strategy. It has a really well-defined, uh, coherent network that's serving a lot of different societal benefits. This network is devoured both by the research community and the observational community. The data streams in this are extremely well ut utilized and highly valued. Um, so it, it really tells a great story about how you could proceed. Um, of course, there is the, the hindrances that we didn't talk about at the beginning. Um, related to polar observation, and it also constrained Goose to a degree, though, though this is maybe a little bit misleading um, for various reasons. But it, it is still important to get back to the, um, the recognition that we, we deal with different challenges in the Arctic. We know it's different um, because we have a lot of different research communities to work with. We do have these technical and cost constraints hampering our observations. And it's a more un unwieldy problem to understand which observations are going to be widely valued and, and why and by whom. Um, because really, in the Arctic, we have a lot of competing interests at times. So it's important reality check on a large framework process. 
But what we hope to do and propose to do is, at least in the in the near term, to blend these um, strategy, these strategical and tactical approaches into um, what the tech community calls stratics, because we want to get started um, on some uh, some quick wins. We want to understand our process. Uh, well, and we want to for we want to foster the kinds of well-organized networks that are going to help us get there. We want to understand what a few uh, a discrete subset of tactical quick wins might look like for the observational community, and then we want to also simultaneously think about how we can build towards this broader uh, vision framework that, uh, that draws itself from these community efforts. The more we understand who the networks are, who the communities are, the stronger we'll be able to support a framework like this. And then eventually entrain those ideas into that bigger picture. So you can refer back to some of these ideas that Noah is starting to think about and, and gen up um, under this quick wins category. I won't go into them in any detail right now. Uh, because I want to get back to this leadership and vision challenge that I think what we're really trying to do and what we can do through this IARPIC forum is find those lone nuts who I would describe as authoritative and resourced leadership bodies. Uh, we want to really foster the first followers, help them uh, entrain uh, and engage new um, efforts to get people pointing in the, strong, in, in the same direction. We want to create capacity um, where there isn't. So if there's research networks missing somewhere, we want to understand what we can do about it. And then using this space to sustain the dialogue process and really to help both US Aon and the networks that would contribute to it to all um, be easy to follow so that it's, it's easy for, for more people to join into what we're doing. So these were some of the dialogue questions, um, just sort of starting on the finding the lone nuts um, issue. Uh, and we can leave these questions up. I think versions of them are also in the agenda. And um, we're really just interested in having a dialogue for the next 15 minutes to hear from you all.